Welcome, let's begin with the fifth chapter in human geography and here we would be talking about primary activities. Initially, we saw the different sectors of the economy and how through geography we understand the distribution of various activities based on which we can understand the industrial location and the trade and transport geography. So, this chapter forms the basis for the primary activities. Now, as we understood in our previous lectures, primary activities are those activities where you are directly dependent on the nature so three basic activities we would classify here those are hunting and gathering then you have agriculture and mining so those are the three major classifications besides that we all also say you have forestry fishing uh, querying so those are other activities that we are that are part of the primary activities now let's first begin the with the very first one that's the hunting and the gathering as we know through the birth of the civilization you had the hunting activities and the gathering activities where the man used to consume the food resources directly from the nature and therefore it's considered as one of the oldest and one of the most primitive ways of economic activity even in the harsh climatic conditions where you don't have ample of trees you would have the hunting activities that would exist so climatic conditions are leading to hunting however where you have favorable climatic condition a lot of vegetation that's seen you would have the gathering activities that would be seen small investment is required with meager investment you can begin this activity and it does not in involve a high level of technological expertise that is there most of the cases where we see where you have extreme cold or extreme hot conditions where you do not have ample of vegetation that could be seen those would be the areas where you would have hunting activities over the years certain areas have been demarcated as illegal areas for hunting or poaching and therefore you have a limited area where hunting activities could be done most commonly the tribal people with their primitive to uh, tools like hoes sticks do the hunting activity that is seen now coming on to the next activity and that's what is the gathering now food gathering is usually seen in two common areas those are the low lot la sorry the low latitude areas and the high latitude areas under the high latitude areas you would have parts of north canada north eurasia south child that would be there in the low latitude areas it's mainly the parts of amazon basin the rainforest areas in africa you have parts of northern Austra australia that's there and definitely the southeast asia so those are the regions where you would have the gathering activity that is seen classified under high latitudes and low latitude areas now usually they collect leaves bark stems twigs uh, some of the material is very very useful for example from the bark you get quinine which is used to uh, cure malaria similarly you have cork that is supplied for mainly the beverages uh, the chewing gum after the flavor is gone the remaining part is obtained from the milky juice of zapota tree so that's again one of the major elements that is seen however over the years we have realized you have synthetic substitutes coming in in line of the uh, major materials that could be obtained from the uh, nature directly which are these synthetic substitutes are much cheaper so it's very very important that these activities are being affected over the years now under pastoralism uh, we have two activities one is the nomads or the which do the nomadic herding the second is the commercial livestock ranching or rearing that's there so let's first talk about hunting over the years we realize that if there is continuous hunting that is done it would make the atmosphere or the climate unsustainable so to make the climatic conditions scalable for civilizations to come it was required that there is a need to domesticate and with this domestication came the idea of herding so nomads are the people who do not have one common piece of land at an area they move from one place to another in search of food in search of job and they move along with their animals so the tools transport shelter everything uh, they rely on is for uh, the animals and they keep moving with their animals from one place to another usually and commonly seen in the regions of sahara the desert area where you have sheep goat camels that are reared 
camel has been considered as one of the major ways for uh, moving for the nomadic herders similarly in tibet and andes you have yak and llamas that are used now if there is a movement across the latitudes it's what is known as nomadic herding however there is another movement which is interesting and that's movement on the hill top and down the hill and this movement is known as transhumans activity so transhumans is what is important and this transhumans implies that people are moving up and down the hill during the winter months they come down the hill during the summer months they climb up the hill common examples are bakarwas gaddis bhutias in the regions of india now pastoralism has three important areas that we say the core area is the area in the northern parts of africa the central part of china the regions of mongolia the whole belt is spreading from africa till china would be the core area for nomadic pastoralism the second area extends into the region of eurasia and the third area in the southwest part of africa along with the island of madagascar so those are the important areas for nomadic herding the next is commercial livestock ranching this is uh, rearing this is much more organized a lot of capital investment is required usually practiced on permanent ranches now ranches you have large areas that are divided and these divided areas you have regulated farming that is you uh, sorry regulated grazing that is done so with each fenced area you would have the regulated grazing of so and so many animals that would be done the number of the animals which are kept in one pasture would be uh, according to the carrying capacity of that pasture so it's highly maintained animals are mainly reared for wool milk then you have hide skin and there has been a lot of packing processing and scientific development scientific industry that has been uh, working around you have genetic breeding that is seen uh, health conditions health improvement disease control that is seen and uh, similarly in the areas which are very cold like the alaska areas you have reindeer rein uh, rearing that is also seen so it's really really interesting to know this works on different aspects in different parts of the world the next is agriculture now agriculture we have numerous classifications so you have subsistence you have plantation and so on so the idea here is we'll understand each of those one by one subsistence agriculture means that you are doing agriculture to fulfill your own basic requirement so there is no aim to sell that into the market now when you are you don't have an aim to sell that into the market you are growing the crops locally for local consumption for family and for family consumption basically now what is important is it is practiced widely in the areas of tropical africa then you have parts of central and south america parts of southeast asia vegetation is cleared now in india we call it zooming cultivation which is slash and burn agriculture you have one parcel of land you clear it you move on to the next parcel then to third parcel and after four or five years you return back to the first parcel by the time you have the soil fertility that is regained now this subsistence agriculture could be classified either as primitive agriculture or primitive subsistence agriculture or intensive subsistence agriculture when i say primitive it's using very primitive tools like hoes and sticks however when you are talking about intensive subsistence that means the parcel of land is small you have huge lot of population that is dependent on that uh, that land parcel and then what you do is you have the agriculture that is seen commonly seen in the monsoon asian areas now this intensive subsistence could be further divided into two intensive subsistence with paddy and without paddy with paddy means or dominated by paddy means you have mainly the rice cultivation that is seen the land is holdings are very very small you have limited machinery that is used a lot of manual labor that is used fertility is being maintained by use of manures however when you have crop without paddy you have the relief climate soil conditions that are being seen uh, grown in many of the areas besides monsoon asia as well so you have north korea 
India, you have the regions of North Japan, North China, where you have lot of cultivation without paddy that is seen. In India, it's mainly the Indo-Gangetic Plain. The coastal area is the area where you have with paddy cultivation, and the Northeast India where you have uh, the rice cultivation that is commonly seen. The idea is. From this cultivation, there was a need to move towards a profit-oriented cultivation. And for a profit-oriented cultivation, what was required was a plantation agriculture. So plantation agriculture, which was introduced by Europeans in most of the colonies of uh, European regions, was mainly for cash uh, crops, which could basically gain uh, something in the market. So you have tea, coffee, rubber, cotton, palm oil, sugar cane, pineapples, bananas. So those were some of the common vegetation and plants that were seen. Large estates were owned by the Europeans. You had a lot of investment, lot of cheap labor and scientific cultivation that was promoted with good transport so that the production from this region could be transported to the other area. So uh, the French colonies, wherever they established, basically in the parts of Western Africa, you had lots of coca and coffee plantations that were seen. In India, mainly it was the tea in the parts of uh, Sikkim and Assam. And then you had rubber in southern India, Kerala. So you had uh, sugarcane plantations, banana plantations that were seen in West Indies. Similarly, uh, in the regions of Philippines, where you had a lot of Spanish and Americans who invested, it was mainly the coconut and the sugarcane that was seen. Uh, a lot of coffee uh, gardens were seen and these were called as fazandas in South America. So there were various uh, forms of cultivation that was used. The next is extensive commercial grain. Now extensive as the name suggests, the farm area is a lot big. So you have a lot big farm area with very few people who are working there. Commonly seen mainly in the parts of semi-arid areas, barley, oat, ray is the common uh, vegetation that is grown here parts of america uh, wheat however has been a principal crop which has been grown here so most of the grasslands like the steppes in eurasia you had the pampas the prairies in north america the pampas in south america you have the downs uh, in australia the canterbury plains in new zealand so all these grassland areas were the areas where we say you have extensive commercial grain farming. The next is mixed farming. Mixed farming in highly developed parts of the world, uh, mainly the Northwest Europe, Eastern parts of North America. You have parts of Southern continents that were also seen. Here you have crop rotation along with intercropping, livestock rearing, a lot of expenditure is seen lot of fertilizers manures that come into play the next is dairy farming commonly seen in the regions of new zealand western europe tasmania parts of southeast australia uh, this is the region where you have lot of capital investment storage is a big issue then you have genetic breeding genetic engineering health veterinary services that comes into play lot of labor is required for it and this is highly labor intensive with no off season as in agriculture so with dairy you don't have any off season refrigeration pasteurization all of these storage uh, shelf life maintaining the shelf life transportation are all the activities associated with dairy farming highly labor intensive the largest part as we saw is in the northwest part of europe the second largest is canada and the th third largest is the region of new zealand parts of southeast australia and tasmania then you have mediterranean agriculture close to the mediterranean sea and then you have parts of south california central child you have the uh, mediterranean cultivation grape oranges citrus fruits olives figs are some of the major productions that are seen here now the grapes which are good they go for wine manufacturing however the inferior quality are dried as raisins and currants so you have market gardening which is a concept coming in in the urban areas so under the urban areas the periphery you have crops like vegetables fruits flowers that are sold into the urban market it's highly labor and capital intensive lots and lots of irrigation fertilizer uh, insecticides is seen highly dense northwest uh, europe uh, northeast asia and parts of mediterranean region you have market gardening activities that are run 
now here you have two things one is truck farming truck farming means it's far not more than overnight so whatever is grown would be transported to the urban area in the overnight period and that's mainly for the vegetables besides this you also have factory farming where a lot of production goes in the factory and it's coming out from the factory so mainly for the poultry section so you have the cattle rearing poultry breed selection scientific breeding that is commonly seen so those are some of the major aspects of market gardening the next is cooperative and collective farming now cooperative and collective farming are two different aspects when i say cooperative farming a group of farmers come together and they work around for the favorable terms the quality of the production that they would be doing at a cheaper rate so in Denmark every member is a part of the cooperative society that is there however collective farming is a concept that originated in Russia the, the uh, USSR the for, uh, former uh, Russia we could say or former USSR and the idea was you have the coal coals which are the collective form, farms and the production is mainly for self-sufficiency the poor farmers pool in together their land their resources their capital and in order to meet the daily requirements they have small plots where they grow the crops individually uh, the farmers pay taxes for their produce uh, they hire the machinery that is required and based on the nature of the work they are paid so it's kind of uh, work based on sorry pay based on the work so good work would be given exceptional rewards average work would be given an average reward so that was the idea under collective farming so cooperative farming and collective farming are important now so far we talked about hunting gathering and agriculture pastoralism now coming on to the next important section is mining mining has been in uh, in content since the times of copper age, bronze age, iron age, but the actual development came up or boomed up with industrial revolution. So with the industrial revolution, there was requirement to build an infrastructure. Now this required two types of factors for mining. One was the physical factor, the other was the economic factor. Physical factors talked about the size, the grain and the mode of occurrence of a deposit. The economic factor talked about the demand for the mineral, the available technology that is there, the capital that is required for the infrastructure to be made, the cost of the transportation associated with it. Now, mining could also be explained under two ways. You have the surface mining and the deep mining. So surface mining is also known as the open cast mining. It is the cheapest way of mining that could be done. A lot of uh, safety precautions are not required but when you have a deep shaft mining that is done you have a drilling that goes very deep into the earth and from there you have the minerals that are extracted. Now this extraction requires definite skill definite use of equipments, uh, safety precautions, distinct kind of training that is required for the same. Sometimes you have poisonous gas, fire, uh, floods that could be released from the deep shaft mining so uh, this mining has to be done very very carefully uh, most of the mining or most of the countries which are dependent on mineral a lot of the earning comes from the minerals alone for example parts of africa parts of south uh, america that is seen so those are some of the important aspects that we understand under primary activities in the upcoming classes we would be talking about the secondary and the tertiary activities so stay tuned for our series on human geography. Have a wonderful day ahead.